Welcome to the fourth Tipping the Pain Scale event hosted by APNC and our statewide partners, the UNC System Office, the North Carolina um, Independent Colleges and Universities, the, um, <clears throat> the um, North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition, and then here with us today, we're, we're broadcasting from um, the AHEC, at the Eastern AHEC. So our partners here are Eastern AHEC and Eastern Carolina University. Of course, we're dressed appropriately uh, for, for ECU uh, intentionally. So welcome to this event. I hope <clears throat> everyone has had a chance to see the movie. If you have not had a chance to see the movie, uh, there's still time. So if you didn't quite get that in before the conversation, you can still check that, use that link later through tomorrow and, and watch the film. <clears throat> in a minute, I'm going to introduce you to our panelists. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to set the stage by letting you know why, why we decided to do this uh, from APNC. So we saw this film and our staff all previewed it early. Uh, we saw this film and thought that it was really important and really well-timed for the space and time we're in right now in terms of people, the impact that COVID has had, um, of course, on people who have addiction and mental health issues, but also just <clears throat> are marginalized in lots of ways. Anyway, our field is strained in the treatment, prevention, treatment, recovery, and harm reduction. We are all strained and taxed in a way that we have never been before. As we know, you know, demand has, has risen for people needing help. <clears throat> our, our system really has never been in a place to ever be able to meet the demand. Um, there's never enough money for us to fill all, to meet all the service needs that there are out there. And now add everything that we've been through and all of the diseases of despair and isolation and how that impacts mental health and substance use that gets us to the place we're in now, which is why we're doing this film. Um, we are going <clears throat> across the state, having community conversations, <clears throat> and that's exactly what we want them to be. For those of you online with us, what we will do afterwards is you'll get a survey uh, asking you what's important, what do you want us to carry forward, we're painting a picture essentially across the whole state and we're following up with our leaders. Um, so you, you will recognize that it's our local leaders here. So we are having a community conversation. APNC will follow up with our elected officials who, are, who will also see the vignettes from the movie and then hear the voices of each area about what's important, what's needed, what's going well, and what are we missing? So our, our leaders, both our elected officials, as well as our state leaders are, are waiting to hear. So please let us hear from you on that. <clears throat> so that's why we're doing this right now. Um, I think the other, the other thing is during this last you know, couple few years, especially one of the things that we've seen shift is that harm reduction is getting noticed in a way that it, it wasn't before. And that is because of the moment in time we're in. There is so much dramatic needs that we're being asked to consider where we need to plug things in and harm reduction is finally getting the, <clears throat> the, the credential, or not the credentials, but the, the recognition that it needs. Now with that, what we also know is with, when, when you raise up something new, there's always sort of fire that you take. We all know that in the field very well. And so our partners in harm reduction, we're happy to partner with them on this and, and stand shoulder to shoulder with them as they're, as they're going through some of those challenges um, as well. Our legislators and our state leaders have been head down. I mean, just sleeves rolled up as high as you can get them working on these issues since the pandemic happened. Now, much of that has been response, making sure that there are people out there. How do we handle this? What's the policy? What do we do? Um, what that means is that they've been a little less able to touch the fine points of what's happening on the ground. And so that's another reason we wanted to do this because they want to hear intimately what happens in each area. Greenville is gonna be different than Boone. We're doing Boone later this week. Those are very different communities. And so, so what we wanna do is hear from you. And, and we thought this is a really important time to be having these conversations. As we're all challenged in a space that we've never been in before, I think 
I think what I would like all of our panelists and, and for all of the viewers to know is that it's really easy for us to um, point at what doesn't work, point at what's wrong, point at who's doing something not good enough. I think we're all in a space that we really have to figure it out together. We're sort of beyond the space of having the luxury of saying, well, this should work better. No, this should work better. And so these, these conversations are not supposed to be easy. They're not supposed to be, we all know the answers. APNC doesn't know the answers. Not, nobody on this panel knows the answers. There's no one answer. So they're hard conversations. And so thank you for joining us for these. Um, that's it's the, the reason that APNC is doing this right now is because we all have an opportunity to think about how we're looking at what people need right now and shape what goes forward. So, so it's a unique moment in time and thank you for joining us <clears throat> for that. Before we get kicked off into the panel, um, I would like to introduce Roz, who was in, for those of you who were able to catch the film first, was in, in the film, we're delighted to have her. She, this is the first film or the first panel she has been on with us so far. So I'd like to ask Roz to, to kick us off as the, the voice of the movie. We're all delighted to, hear, to see you here with us today and can't wait to, to learn what you have to share with us. Uh -huh. Hi everybody, I'm Roz. Um, so I'll introduce myself briefly about, how, excuse me, about how I got introduced to harm reduction. Um, so I'm a mother of two boys, a grandmother, and the way that I got introduced to harm reduction was essentially an accident. So I lost my brother to murder and my identical twin sister, um, she had a mental health disorder, but also substance abuse disorder. And she ultimately took her life. So I've been kind of on the front lines of working both with homicide and substance abuse, but primarily with families of homicide victims. So I was a little burnt out um, between the suicide of my sister, the murder of my brother, the murder of my boyfriend. So, being so overwhelmed with that, I took a little break. So I was a little burnt out and I just started feeding people, you know, out of my car. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I knew that I wanted to serve, but I just didn't know like in what capacity. Mm -hmm. So in the midst of feeding people, I kept finding people who were unresponsive. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't know I didn't know what to do with that. So then I was trained on how to minister Narcan. And that was in 2018. And then um, I just, I never left the community of harm reduction and um, 922 overdose reversals in. It kind of takes a toll, but at the end of the day, you know, we're essentially saving um, a mother from grieving the loss of their child and I mean the work is needed but we also need like more outreach workers and crisis responders mm -hmm. so I just um I couldn't leave so now I'm working both um in the harm reduction community but also in the one of the largest trauma bays in the country Temple University Trauma Bay mm -hmm. and kind of bringing harm reduction to ERs and uh, providing spaces so that our sunshines can feel comfortable and not not feel stigmatized. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of uh, where I am now. So yeah, and creating like movements like Operation Saver City to kind of um, give a stepping stone to families who don't know where to start, mm -hmm. and like kind of creating the gaps of systems that are broken and navigating through navigating through it to people who've experienced the loss and the frustration and all of that stuff that comes with both harm reduction and homicide. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. You, so you, you mentioned um, 122 reversals. Uh, what, period of, what period of time or what, um, in how big of an area are we talking about? So <clears throat> it, since 2000 and since 2018, um, it's been, first it was 118, 
and then now we're in 2022 is up to 922 and I think the pandemic played a role in the increase of um, overdose reversals because there weren't that many outreach workers on the street because they were scared of COVID. Um, but when you work in a community like Kensington, when I live and work there, you, you see a lot more. You know, you, you can walk out of your step, you know, out of your home and, and you're on your front step, you can see a sunshine clearly in crisis. So it's like, you know, they, they look, a lot of people know that Kensington is like the heroin capital. We have one of the largest um, market air, drug air markets in the country. And it's like, that's my neighborhood. So it's like, how do, how do we change or how do we become part of the solution? And, and just seeing that many people, you can't just like not do anything. You can't stop because there's a pandemic in the middle of a opiate epidemic. Mm -hmm. So you can't, you know, you gotta be out there on the front lines. And a lot of us um, caught COVID, you know, some of us multiple times, but um, that's the price we pay sometimes for meeting people exactly where they are. I think you're, you're, I think what we all really admire about watching you throughout the movie was, of course, I personally love it that you call it Urban Sunshine. You just, there's never a place that the person who needs help would feel how overwhelmed you are. And so I, I think, I think you are just a perfect model of servant leadership in the most beautiful way as, as we've watched you sort of progress throughout the movie and then of course hear what you're what you're working on now um so thank you for that and thank you for being here with us thanks for having me. i'd like to um go down go down the line and have the panelists introduce themselves because they certainly uh can can talk a little bit better about why they're here and what's important and where they're coming from than i can so i'd like to introduce krisha next can you introduce yourself first please i am krisha holly i am a native of Greenville, North Carolina. I'm a certified peer support specialist and I'm also 16 years in recovery. I'm currently working with families that is that are in recovery court with District 8, which includes Lenore, Green, and Wayne County. Uh, Lee Atherton, I'm a faculty member in the Department of Addictions and Rehabilitation Studies at ECU. Um, large advocate of all the services uh, as pertains to mental health and addiction um, and uh, training uh, those that are looking to become mental health counselors and addiction specialists uh, and coordinating services and, and really trying to build relationships with those that are at the table here to help meet a need uh, that we'll talk more about, but the large need that is very much requires the wraparound services of the community. Uh, so just being a small part of that puzzle. I'm Diane Cardin Glenn. I'm the founder of Ecom for Change Syringe Service Program in Greenville, named after, in memory of my oldest son, Michael Cardin, who died of an overdose in 2012. Um, we have about 1,500 um, people who have registered, and we see in our fixed site on Saturday uh, between 130 and 160 participants. So I'm a harm reductionist and basically. I'm just a, a mom who loves other people's children exactly where they're at. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Jesse? My name is Jason Jackson. I um, <clears throat> work for the Pitt County Sheriff's Office um, in the detention center. Um, my job here or there is to, um, it's pretty much program development, implementation and oversight. So we develop programs designed to um, help people who come through the detention center who have mental health issues, substance use, use issues to essentially return to the community without the barriers that they once had. So we try and eliminate um, the issues with them returning or finding housing or, or finding employment, um, education. So we try and we try and take that take those barriers away. So when they leave the detention center, um, they're able to 
entering the housing, they're even entering employment within you know a week or two. We want them. We want them working. Um, we want them educated. We offer you know GED services through Pitt Community College inside the detention center. So then that way you know they're able to um, to to increase their marketability when they leave for better employment. Um, so those are the things I do with the detention center. I've pretty much, I mean, I've worked with um, incarcerated individuals from the state level and in, in prisons from the Department of Corrections, um, as well as doing community work. Uh, I'm also a licensed substance use counselor. So I've done community counseling. Um, so I was able to kind of, for lack of a better term, have the best of both worlds to where I was able to enter into a detention facility and kind of implement some of the things from the incarcerated side as well as the community side in order to kind of um, give the people what they need, like you said, meet them where they are. There's, there's they're typically no lower than they are when they come into the to the detention center. Mm -hmm. So um, we're able to meet them there um, and just kind of focus on their needs. And that was the goal of the sheriff. And that was, you know, her intention. And that's what we want to we want to continue to do. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Howe. I'm a senior director with Third Horizon Strategies. We are a healthcare consulting firm that has had the great pleasure of working with the production of this film. Um, our partner, Greg Williams, is someone whose name you've probably heard before. He is the producer of the film, and we've been really fortunate to see this through fruition. Um, prior to me being at Third Horizon Strategies, I did very similar work to Sarah Potter, um, leading the Illinois Association for Behavioral Health for 20 years. So my background is in advocacy and mental health and substance use work, um, and I am a youth that came out of a prevention program back in Illinois. So um, I'm really humbled to be here and part of this really distinguished panel. So thanks for having me. Great. So we we saw through the film one of the, one of the things that also was really um, illuminating about it was we saw so many communities responding in so many different ways and while you saw the struggle in that you also saw sort of the promise in that and and I loved the way that the stories were laid out. Um, I wanted to be able to highlight that for Greenville for in in this area. Um, what we're doing here in Greenville that stands out, Jason, when you when you were talking, um, we're delighted to have you on the um, on the panel with us because one of the things that we hear about the film was the officer in the film. People love seeing officers who are not just enforcing the law but also care and help. And so, so your vantage point is, and what you're doing is is really unique, and we're we're delighted to have you here. What things stand out for you guys in your role? Um, what stands out in the film as part of the story that that really you are kind of taking with you or you thought was really important um, that you want to pick up on? Let's jump off there. I think for me, Roz and her, the relationship and trust. Right? So within a community, I can speak from the provider world, we can do great work, but people have to have to trust us, have to come in for services. We don't go out into the into the field, right? We're not on that front line. I think it, it's a great reminder that mental health substance use treatment doesn't begin at a treatment center. It begins by engaging within the community. And we need as a group, as a community to really invest in community outreach and invest in developing relationships, building trust, that will filter through the line if someone needs professional treatment, but really just all about the uh, harm reduction work that, that's done within the community, the outreach services. So that was what jumped off the screen to me, is just how important those relationships, that trust is to everything related to recovery. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I wanna agree with Lee, I kinda of wanna to add to that, cause we were, me and Sarah were talking earlier, we were talking about the, the officer who was going to the locations and, and, and she was doing the haircut. I, I mean, I, I think that's the part of the video that I ended. So <laughs> she, she was explaining to me a little bit more detail and um, what Lee was saying, I mean, he, 
himself and, and his colleagues come in and help us in the detention center and do some work. So it's it's more so, like I say, you have to come together as a community and everyone has to kind of work together. There's a lot of little things that, um, that I've learned that happen where um, some people are attempting to do one thing, there's other a group doing another thing, there's another group doing another thing, and we're all not bringing that together yeah. and, and, and making it work smoothly, like yeah. you said, together and, and seamlessly. And I think that's, that's one big thing that I, that I would love to see that I think would help more people. Mm -hmm. I think what stood out to me was um, Mr. Green, mm -hmm. just the connection that he has with the youth and, mm -hmm. and being able to start with the youth to say, you know, um, we have to watch what we say. You know, mm -hmm. stigma is real and language is important around the people that we serve. Mm -hmm. And starting them off young, starting that off young is great because what I see in my neighborhood is a lot of abuse towards people who are homeless and who are truly, truly suffering from addiction. And they, you know, they don't have the same protections that we do. Mm -hmm. You know, they're very vulnerable, they're asleep and they're like, being hit while they're sleeping by, by people, you know, because they don't understand that they're not there because they want to be there. So Mr. Green definitely really, uh, yeah. I think mostly what I, when I, what I pulled out of it was that it just made me feel like we're not alone in our struggle. That sometimes even though we're in a small community, you know, we think we're facing all the, the health care and, and, and all the other problems by ourselves. And the film basically just said it's, you know, you're not alone. Everybody's struggling with the same problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was just <clears throat> mentioned Joseph talking to young people. And as you as you say that we we get APNC is is such a unique connector across the whole service system, but also with programs that are working with people and legislators and policymakers and our state leaders that that we hear we hear all of the stories and one of the one of the the places that we've heard I've heard a lot of requests for help and and feeling that really I feel really alone space yeah. is when parents are struggling with a young person and they don't know, they don't know first of all how to talk about it. Second of all, whether it's really a problem. I hear this, is this a real problem or is this just a sign of the times? Is, just, is this just teenagers? How do, I, how do I help? How do I figure that out? And then I think there's, you know, there's a, lot of, a lot of shame in that too for parents who feel like this is my child. I should know better than anyone else what to do for them and I don't know what to do for them. And so that Echoing what you're just saying, that sort of feeling alone, I, I'm sure that we all have felt alone in our in our own vantage point, right? And so, so um, to your point about like the community coming together and that connection piece, that's really, really, um, really important. Uh, I think for everyone, professionals, for, for people who are out in the community, for for humans, right? For humans, because the fact of the matter is that if if you or someone who you know in your family is not struggling in some way or has struggled throughout the last couple of years, you're in the minority at this point. Um, so, you know, so I think we can all probably tack into that sort of feeling of, of being alone in one way or another. So thank you for saying that. Krisha, you were gonna you were gonna say something. Yeah, um, what I was gonna say was being in a community, actually being with those sunshines that you said, it really, really helps even, you know, with the police and even with the criminal justice system because the criminal justice system wants to penalize them for the crimes that they commit due to the fact that they're they, they are reaching out because they need some help, but they don't know how and things of that nature and just putting them in jail but you take somebody like me who's been in recovery, who 
is an outreach worker, going out there with them and meeting them halfway instead of just locking them up and say, hey, I'm going to take your kids or you will get this charge or whatever, just taking the time out. So to figure out what they need, because we don't, some of not us here on the panel, but some some of those that, that they are not able to go out there do not ask, what do you feel that's going to help you get to where you want to be from out of this situation? Because they are the expert of their own lives. They know, and sometimes they don't know, but just giving them that space of asking what you need, then we can be able to work towards getting you some help. Yeah. Emma, go oh, so, go um, Jason and I were actually talking before, before the film and Sarah, you had mentioned that some of the work that Jason was doing was really unique and it correlates back to Josh in the film, right? Mm -hmm. And I would actually argue, I don't think it's unique. I just think, don't think we know about it. Yeah. And I think that's mm -hmm. the whole point of why the film came together. One is, yes, it's seven different stories or eight different stories, which is just eight stories, right? But there's 800, there's 8,000 stories out there. And our job now is it's, it's one thing to watch a film and really enjoy it. It's another, where do you, where do you take it? Where do you go? And Raj, you talked about stigma and what we say and how it matters. And so I think part of it, you know, for the audience is you do this work, you have a passion for this work. So what I wish we had people in the audience that we could ask them because the question would be, what is this inspiring you to do? What are you going to do next? And how are we going to take that forward? Because I think what you do is amazing, but I bet there's a lot more to you than we realize because we don't get to hear those stories. And so we need to mm -hmm. take that and get that out there. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I think the unique thing about you, Jason, is that you have, you have, of course, the law enforcement background, but you also have a degree. You have a clinical degree in this. And I, and I think that's fairly mm -hmm. uncommon. So in, in our field, it's different for us to show up as, as mental health folks, mm -hmm. right? Like when I, if I, I used to do crisis work, when I show up as a crisis worker, I am clearly there to help. When a law enforcement person shows up in uniform, it, it, it is a different conversation. They cannot, come, they're charged when they come in, mm -hmm. especially if you're, mm -hmm. you're working with someone who is in a real crisis, it amps it up. And so, you know, just acknowledging that that our law enforcement are walking into really difficult places. Many of them are not necessarily equipped by trade or, you know, support. there's certainly lots of um, programming and training for law enforcement to help with those things, but it's different than us coming in as, as helpers in the field. It, it, it's so just adding on to, to the thoughts about that. So one thing as well that that I I don't know if it's unique or or not, but I know I do know in this state there's there's we do what we've done at our detention center is added in the clinical social worker as well. Mm -hmm. So um, that clinical social worker is embedded in the detention center and hired and works for the sheriff's office. It's not you know someone who works for another company or another agency who comes in to help. She is our staff, our employee. Mm -hmm. So um, we're able to, again, meet those needs. So we'll, she's able to speak to these individuals as they come in, you know, find out exactly what their needs are and try and meet their needs. And then she's all, you know, she can also do some, some mental health counseling, some substance use counseling, some intervention, crisis intervention. And we're able to teach officers and deputies how to deal with certain situations when they come up. So, um, because we do, I mean, we do do some other trainings um, in there now where we're offering like mental health first aid training mm -hmm. um, that goes along with the CIT. Yep. So, I mean, we're able to kind of incorporate some of those things in there. And, and so we're, so we're working with everyone, mm -hmm. so to speak. We're trying to, we're trying to, because you're right, a lot of times um, when you're coming from a law enforcement standpoint or a correctional standpoint, you know, you're, you're trying to go in there and handle the situation and be done with it mm -hmm. as quickly and efficiently as possible, or, you know, and, and safely as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're coming from a clinical standpoint, you, you know, you have a different mindset where you want to go in there and try and you, you, the outcome should be the same, but <laughs> there'll be less resistance. Mm 
<laughs> I'll say it that way. Yes. Yes. Um, so now we're trying to kind of marry the two right. and, and make it work in, in everybody's interest, especially for the people who, like I said, the clients, the, the patients, the inmates, right. however you want to call them, but the ones who are in need of the service, the service right. users. Right. Um, so that's, I mean, that's what we're doing. So it is, a, it is an interesting dance, but I think we've been doing it well so far and hopefully we can continue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, for, for those of you at home, uh, to your point, Sarah, they can ask questions. So I'm sure there's lots of chat happening that we can, we just can't see. Um, when we get towards the end, we will take questions. So be thinking about what you want to ask myself or any of the panelists or what you would just like to hear a conversation about um, as we go forward. So let's pick up on, on what is happening here in this area. Um, you, you started, you, you led us on that path. So let's continue that thread. What's happening in this area that that is promising that you would like, let's pretend Greenville is entirely unique and no place else in the state is doing anything. What are the high points? That's obviously not true, but what are the things that you would stand up that you would want to make sure that, that others that know is promising or is going well? Because sometimes we, we don't take time to recognize that. So what would you like to share about what's happening here? I can't say the, um, to talk about the detention center and how the sheriff brought, brought in the Sharp and Wear program. That's an excellent program um, that's in the detention center and giving folks the chance to, you know, for another life. Um, there's a lot of, um, of uh, some of the providers here are hiring peer support, mm -hmm. not just because just to have us here just to do transportation or anything like that, which is that is important, but implementing peer support because the provider is recognizing now the peer supports we rock and we to be, they will tell us mm -hmm. what's going on first mm -hmm. rather than they tell the provider. Cause mm -hmm. we know, and when they come and call us, well, what happened? Oh, like you didn't know that? Yeah, I said, yeah, they tell me everything. Oh, they tell us everything. It's like we help the provider on, or, in the, or the clinical team to help navigate on how to help them next or why they're missing, you know, if they on mat treatment, why they're missing the doses or why they're not coming to see you guys or mm -hmm. it's the stigma or how you talking to them or this is the reason why they're so drawn, so they, un, you know, understand and bringing in peer support. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know. I'm sure Diane will bring it up, but we have a syringe exchange program mm -hmm. five years ago. Mm -hmm. We would never have believed that would come to Eastern North Carolina, but, but Greenville, Pitt County, and other counties have, and it's mm -hmm. an amazing step that harm reduction and all the work that APNC has done and, and harm reduction coalition in the state has done to raise the awareness and, and increase the availability of those services. Because harm reduction is a mindset, but there's a lot of tangibles that can go with it. And without those tangibles, it doesn't really get to the people that need it. Uh, yeah. So the work Diane does uh, with the storage exchange and uh, other services that, that come around that, I think are much needed as part of our continuum of the substance use process, the recovery process. Uh, having people enter during active use or during time of transition, have resources, have a place to go and be safe and, and get what they need to be safe. Um, without that, we don't see them on the other side as mm -hmm. often. So I think that's a real amazing thing we have in our community. I stole Diane's answer, but sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, to spotlight you. Yeah, well, thank you. No, um, I guess we, just where wear a lot of different hats. <laughs> Um, besides providing um, safe injection supplies, which is just one of the things that we do supply at the at the exchange, um, we also serve a pretty large homeless population here in Greenville, mm -hmm. and who don't need those kinds of supplies, but they come to get a healthy lunch and hygiene items, a food lion card, those kinds of those kinds of things. Um, Lee's um, group comes on uh, one Monday a month. Um, to work with the participants um, to help with education if they need that um, job, you know, hunting, those kinds of things. So mm -hmm. they can provide that service that I'm not able to. 
um, we um, test for hep C and um, HIV, and we just recently um, are now able to um, send folks who are positive for hep C to get um, treatment. Mm. which um which is brand new mm. um we do an art we did an art therapy program with uh, um in conjunction with some other um, groups here in greenville mm -hmm. and um there were 35 people who came it was mostly just a project to show that um even though you may be someone who uses substances and deal with the stigma that you're really important and you have something important to you know to give to the mm. community and that was really popular so they've asked for us to um, to do that again, um, because I lost a child to substance use, I get a lot of calls from parents mm -hmm. who um, have children who are using to ask for advice. I, you know, meet a lot of people one on one, and also because I lost a child to substance use, I have a grasp group, which is grief recovery after substance passing, mm -hmm. and um, we also do that in the same location as the syringe exchange of a, on a different day to kind of deal with, um, you know, the grief and the, the different things that come up if you lose a family member to that. Um, so what else do we do? <laughs> yeah. Those are all great things. Thanks for, thank you for sharing. Um, what I'm hoping again that comes out of these is that as, as we'll put all of these together in sort of vignettes and high points. And, and of course, for those of you uh, out there with the survey in front of you, please fill out the survey because we will take the, all of this to our leaders and say, here's, here's what's good, here's what's happening, here's what we need more of, here's what we have challenges, here's what the hundreds of people that we talked with essentially across the state said, here's what your constituents are saying, here's what our communities are saying. So that's part of our role. So thank you for sharing that. Um, certainly someone heard something that we talked about that they hadn't thought of before or that's missing in their communities. So, so thank you for that. Um, so let's, let's talk just a little bit about, we've talked plenty about um, how important community is, how much of a need there are, there is. I'd like to hear a little bit, I, I would like to hear us all talk just a little bit about um, what it's been like going through such a hard period of time. And I, I, I'm looking at Roz, hoping that you can start this conversation. Because as you were talking about having so many reversals, I just, how are you sitting here with us? How, are you, how, how did you handle that? And I, and I, and I think we, we would like to hear that because we all are struggling through this together. And so, uh, if we can talk just a little bit about sort of what the space and time has been like for us, because we don't we don't come to this work mm -hmm. accidentally. We come to it because we have a story behind us too. And so, can you when you start that conversation, please? Yeah, I think just first acknowledging that that there's an issue with um, burnout because what happens is folks who love to serve feel like that's all that they can do. And when they're not doing it, they feel incomplete sometimes. However, I, keep, I always remind people, you can't serve if you have nothing left. You know, and for me, practicing self-care, and it took years of, um, you know, the mourning process the, of my family, but also, the morning of losing someone when, when administering Narcan and they don't live. So you, you internalize this a lot of times. We all do as people who serve, but acknowledging that that's a problem is key, but also letting that, that feeling be there, be present, but don't let it stay. You know, practicing self-care is, is definitely important. And for me, what works for me, because of the amount, the, the amounts of trauma that I had to endure through the loss of family members, but through the amount of overdoses that I'm reversing and constantly seeing folks close to death, you know, allowing time daily for, for, that, for, that, for that moment. You know, 
I give myself five minutes every morning. Whatever I do with it, that's all I give it. You know, at times, you know, you, you can cry or you can just have a cup of coffee or you can meditate or you can reflect, but giving it a little bit of space and not letting it consume you. Okay. You know, for me that worked, I don't know what works for, for everyone else, but also just like, again, I mean, I can't even emphasize this enough that acknowledging that, that it's there, mm -hmm. that you're feeling the burnout, yeah. you know, not allowing the fact that, you know, you do serve on a daily basis, but you can't serve from an empty cup at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just acknowledging it and practicing it because we can talk it. We can talk, we can share, you know, how we can share mm -hmm. to each other. So you need to practice self-care, go get a massage, but are we really doing it? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, accountability among our peers mm -hmm. is important too. When you, right. when you have to check people right. and that's okay. Yeah, I think for those of us who are natural helpers, that's really hard, especially in the addiction field. Not speaking for anyone on the panel, but in most cases, we come to this work because we have been touched by this exact problem and perhaps been able to come out to the other side of being in recovery. But we still bring some of that with us. We are still who we are. and and that's real hard to pull away from. So you, you said practice self-care, which acknowledge that you're feeling burned out. Yes, um, many of us maybe didn't ever learn how to really do that well in the first place. And, and that gets real hard when you're in a system where you have to decide how to take care of yourself, figure out how to take care of yourself better than you ever learned before based on where you came from, but also take time away from someone else who needs help. That is a really tricky spot to be in. So thank you for, for mentioning that. And I, and I think it does have a whole lot to do with um, the burnout, you say burnout. I, you know, I, think, I think folks that are on the front line in the behavioral health world are, are I, I don't know how they are not suffering sort of secondary trauma from what they are seeing. Um, and that's our first responders too, uh, there's just, there's only so much you can see over and over before you you are impacted. And so yeah. thank you for calling for and, and even if I can if I can say like the minute the minute people start feeling like this is the norm, or the minute that you don't feel anything, there's a problem. You know, the minute that you you run to an overdose and you reverse that overdose and you walk away as if if you're not still rattled by it, yeah. there's a problem, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. I'll say to add on to that, I've had this conversation a couple of times actually in the past month where the phrase that we've used is as kind of the front line um, for behavioral health in particular, but, but I'd say uh, first responders as well, we'd like to be busy. We don't like to just sit and, and do just enough, we, we create a threshold where we walk that fine line of we know where our tipping point is and we don't avoid it, we come right up on it. Um, what I've noticed with the pandemic is what used to be maybe once or twice a year, a extraordinary event would happen that would push us over that, that threshold that would create that, that disbalance that would you know, lead to burnout or stress is happening far more often. Right, that, that we're just constantly in this home life, family work, and then job, right? Everything is being impacted by COVID and restrictions and isolation that that threshold is being challenged more and more that, to your point, is, you know, it, we're, it's scary that you know, we're going to start pushing that threshold, which I would argue no. Uh, and what are we doing for self-care that we need to increase the self-care at the same pace that we're increasing our, our stressors. Um, and that's a, been a new challenge for us, I think, as helpers, where we are very focused on what do our clients need? What does the community need? And at this point, I think we need to really look at what do we need as well to be able to provide that extra assistance. We need to provide ourselves some extra care. Absolutely, yes. To keep us at it, keep us here, keep us working. Um, keep us able to continue to help. Absolutely. Uh, I think that what you just said is really important. 
while while we're while we're with you, Lee, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with you for a second. Okay. Will you talk a little bit more since we are at ECU? Will you talk a little bit more about what ECU is doing to support students who are struggling um, with mental health and addiction, to support students who need help, and and to support students in recovery? Sure. Yeah, uh, we have, as as many other campuses, we are probably well, yeah, at the most benefit the, the biggest campus of, of collegiate recovery and the best if i can say that because no one can stop me from saying it um <laughs> but we integrate you know great service jerry michael harris is here you can't see him he's off camera but he he brought the collegiate recovery program to ecu and, and he brought br elevated our campus's response and integration of, of of addiction or just this idea of recovery Right. And because I think before it's recognizing that there's substance use on campus, we need to have task force and committees that respond to it. We have discipline meant towards some sort of harm reduction, but also, um, you know, making sure that campus is safe. And then we have counseling services. The biggest gap that was missing was how do we help an individual actually address and sustain this idea of recovery? How to define what recovery is and sustain that? So I think our collegiate recovery program on campus is has taken us to that next level. Uh, so we have the traditional services. We have uh, the counseling uh, Center for Counseling and Student Development. We also have our Nav Navigate Counseling Center, which is another one on campus, and a few other um, set, uh, counseling programs that offer services for students as well as community members. Um, but I think the highlight for what we do is the campus infusion of recovery, right from positive messaging and developing of allyship, helping the student body and the faculty and staff understand what it means to be an ally. How do we talk about addiction? How do we talk about substance use? Um, how do we talk about recovery? Um, all the way through to engaging individuals that are struggling, just not sure what is going on in this academic environment in their use of substance. They don't see the, the connection of those, those relationships. Having a space and opportunity for peers to draw them in, to help them have those discussions, and then all the way through to the treatment aspect, if and when that's needed, and continuation of recovery yeah. uh, or support uh, at the other side of that. Yeah. Yeah. I th you, so you have, I have seen that actually, uh, that progression with mm -hmm. DCU. Uh, we, we certainly provi have provided lots of support to collegiate recovery across the state, uh, lots of help. We, we do whatever we can to, to support those programs. Um, but I think that that making visible and normalizing recovery is so important. So coming from the prevention space, what we know is young people, their worlds are not, not as large as ours. Their vantage point is not as big as ours. And so to them, when they see people struggling or using substances, that, that then means everyone. And so, so I actually had a, a young person recently tell me, well, everyone is struggling so much that it's pretty common to hear multiple times a day, I just wanna kill myself and, or I'm just using, and, yeah. and in their world, that is how it is. And so I think what you're doing with really getting recovery out there and healthy students out there and that, that visibility of you no, know, there, there, are, there are ways to still stay healthy right now. There are ways for help, I think is, has, has been really beautifully done. Yeah, I think that is an important thing, especially on college campuses, where the this idea of norms that every you know of the ten people I know I'm really close to, seven of them drink heavily, or seven of them are really normalizing excessive use. I expand that to well, that's everybody. Seventy percent of the college campus does that. I just have seven friends that are a little bit higher up than than the rest of the body, and being able to in, be introduced to or get to know people that. Have different mindsets and different views and different perspectives it really helps to shift the view and, and shift the norms if you will towards what's more accurate which is it's not as prevalent but in someone's mind that's what tips the scale for them is that if i think that's what i'm supposed to do that's what i do uh, so creating a space that allows for more conversation not just hiding this idea of substance use and you know pushing it under the rug but letting it be open and really having these these discussions and conversations so that people can explore this is what all these perspectives are and, and increase their knowledge and, and norms around them. Yeah. 
thank you for that. Krisha, you you mentioned peer support as one of the strengths uh, of this area and, and really use of peer support. Can you talk just a little bit more about the use of peers in the recovery courts house? A little more specifically about that. I'm wondering, uh, probably others are wondering a little, a little more about how that looks. Well, I am the person that <clears throat> kind of the middle person that intercedes for the court and in the people and the participants of recovery court because a lot of times they're coming in angry they upset mm -hmm. they mad they frustrated they don't have they got criminal charges on top of having petitions against them and don't have their children mm -hmm. so I, I don't come in to address what the issues are within the criminal with with criminal or the petitions I come in to get to the root of things mm -hmm. to help them get to the place where they want to be for their recovery not only for themselves first but also for their families mm -hmm. and also for the rest of their their lives so um that's where I come in at and trying to help you know the judge the, the lawyers, the drug court coordinators understand what's going on. Um, also, we do have, you know, the providers that, that are on the drug court team. So most of the time, because I work with the participants so close, I pretty much know what's going on with them. And to help the courts understand what recovery is, what, a, what substance use look like, what mental health looks like, and providing information to them to how to work with the participants or work with our folks mm -hmm. a little more, I wouldn't say better, but to have a little more um, uh, success mm -hmm. in the program instead of just saying, hey, we're going to get you a sanction and you're going to jail. Mm -hmm. That's not going to help them. And they have said it several times or me being the only um, black woman that's on the drug court team and someone that is a minority coming in and said, uh-uh, I'm not doing this. I, I'm not doing this, Miss Krisha. Come on, let's get some Krispy Kreme donuts and a coffee. And I was like, okay, but let's go talk about how we're going to do drug court next week, you know, since you didn't come this week, you know, that type of thing, you know. And so just getting the courts, just getting the court system, the, ju the criminal justice system to understand instead of laying the hammer down on, on my babies, allow my babies to get through what they're getting through because it's a lot of trauma there. Let's get to the root of some stuff. So when you start working at the root, then we can be able to help them get to where they want to be in their recovery and be successful in recovery court. Yeah. Thank you for, for doing that mm -hmm. really important work. I am. I am confident, I've known you for quite a long time. I am confident that you have helped a lot of people get through that to, to the other side that would not have if you hadn't been there. So thank you for sharing what that really looks like and <laughs> what the value of that is. Before we have a, a few more minutes until we take some questions from, from our friends uh, on the other side of the screen from us, but I, but I do, we would be remiss uh, at APNC if we did not raise the question of how we come at this from the public policy perspective. One of, the, one of the things I really loved about the film was that you saw an issue happening with care denials, and then you saw it go all the way through to raising up leadership in places of power and policies changing. And I think it's, it's hard for us to see those stories, um, so I'd like to, to talk a little bit about that. So what would, if you could wave a magic wand and change one policy and make it happen tomorrow, what would it be? I know there's, well, for me, there's a very long list, but, but um, what would that be? What comes to mind? Either in terms of public policy or, or, or really important programs maybe are not funded in the ways that they need to. I consider that policy too, because you, that's health policy, getting it out there. So what would you like to see change? The time, the time in, in facilities, mm -hmm. like you can't expect someone 
to go into a recovery mm -hmm. center for six days and be mm -hmm. and, and be okay. Right. Yeah, that's true. You know, you just can't. Um, and and if you're on one substance and the other substance is in, in your system, you can't, they won't treat you because you have you have benzos and it just doesn't make sense, you know, to me if whatever substance you on, they they both need we need treatment. Mm -hmm. So even because they're on two different substances, why can't you treat them for both? Mm -hmm. So there's an issue with that, and there's a smoking ban. Like you're gonna not allow someone to smoke their cigarettes because you want them. I just like that doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. You know, you can smoke your cigarettes. You know, you're you're trying to kick heroin or fentanyl. Do you, why are you worried about tobacco? I mean, they're worrying mm -hmm. about the the wrong things mm -hmm. or the caffeine. Like to me, it's just like mind boggling. And most people drink coffee every day. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. So you're worrying about that? I don't. Yeah. Insurances, like private insurances and yeah. you know, the, yeah. the treatment that folks on private insurance get opposed to the treatment that people in Medicare get. Mm -hmm. It should be the same across the board. Right. Right. I was just talking about that with um, my judge and um, it's a treatment center. <clears throat> that's in the eastern area that just during the fiscal year of last year, they just changed over and they doing the whole uh, Medicaid reformation thing or whatever. And now they accept in Medicaid now at this treatment center. Mm -hmm. But before they never did, they only did private insurance and buy money. And I'm just like, one of my, one of my babies was able to go because mm -hmm. she has Medicaid. And I'm just like, now? You know, I'm glad she's in there now, but what would have happened a year ago when we try to get her in there and she don't have the, she don't have the insurance or the money to get in those treatment centers. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think um, but both of you have brought this up, but when you, when you look at the film, particularly in Washington where, you know, the law was changed, um, you know, really in terms of denials, we're still seeing that across the country. These denials are in Medicaid, they are in private insurance, being that they're across the board. And yet we have a federal law that goes back to 2008, the federal parity law. One of the exciting things I think that came out of this, and I don't remember if it's in the postscript of sort, at the end of the film, we see that um, Mayor Walsh becomes Secretary Walsh. Um, but what we just had in the last month was a report to Congress from Secretary Walsh about what is happening in parity and what is not happening in parity. And I think part of that, when you go back to your question of what can be done, first of all, there, you know, there's a federal law that needs to be enforced and we need to raise our voices to our policymakers that we want that enforced. But then states can enact stronger parity laws. Mm -hmm. And it's incumbent on us to raise our voices and say, it's not okay that we're seeing these denials. You know, there, there's a significant challenge between that non-level playing field between commercial insurance and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And there is a plethora of policies that we can put in place to make sure that does mm -hmm. not happen. We know not everybody is gonna take Medicaid, but those that do should get the exact same level of care. Mm -hmm whether you have a commercial card or a Medicaid card. And we can make that difference in the state. We can change the state law and still demand to our congressional reps and our senators mm -hmm. that they enforce parity. It, it's 2008. If an insurer tells you it's a really complicated law, I, I call <laughs> BS on that. <laughs> no, 2008 is plenty of time. Yeah. Yes. 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 Jason, did you have one? Well, Don't no, I, I, mean, I agree because I, that was one of my bigger issues too with, with just insurance companies not helping the individuals that need treatment. Because um, I, I mean, if they can get treatment in the community, they won't come see me. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's just, and it, it just makes sense. I mean, it saves a lot more money. I mean, we spend a lot more money housing and feeding and clothing people than we do put them to work and making them productive. Right. Um, so, I mean, if they can just go ahead and, and if, if they can receive that treatment, it'll reduce the delinquent behavior, the criminal behavior, mm -hmm. and, and then they'll get the treatment they need and, and we'll have a more positive 
Yeah. Outcome. Yeah. I think what I would like to see, and this goes across lots of policies, I think probably everyone that we just mentioned was a real paradigm shift at how we are thinking about addressing these problems. We are still seeing punitive, punitive laws come through. We are still seeing laws that are just, if there's a, a hard enough punishment, or if we just lay the hammer down, as you were saying, we are seeing that in policy over and over and over again. And even worse than making that mistake of thinking we can just get the, the big enough hammer, this is gonna solve the problem. Even worse than that, we're not seeing the remediation and the support come along with it. Yeah. So we're really still backwards about how we are seeing that and stigma mm -hmm. comes in and how we're judging marginalized populations. And people that have, have addiction issues who need help are still being sort of punished. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, across the board, across every policy, what I would like to see is that paradigm shift to increasing, increasing um, access to services, reducing barriers that are out there that come across in lots of ways. So I won't go down my whole list of, of policy issues that I would like to see changed, but across all of them, that's what I would like to see. So I think we are ready to take some questions from, from the audience. Um, Morgan, <laughs> can you help us with that? Okay, is my mic on? Can y'all hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, Something I want to point out, I get the like fun of watching the, the chat happen. Um, and this one's very lively. People are like shouting hey to each other and <laughs> answering each other's questions. And I think it's um, a testament to the community that's been built in this part of the state, how everyone seems to know each other and, and want to already collaborate, um, even in this virtual format. So that's been pretty cool to see. Um, First question, it says, how can you educate or how can we educate local law enforcement on syringe exchange programs? I think we're all working on it. I mean, we're all working towards it. Um, and I do know now, I mean, we've developed between the sheriff's office and and, and Greenville Police, we, we have, um, you know, co-responder program. So we have licensed professionals going out with, with officers when they need them. Um, so it's just gonna be, in terms of the education piece, I mean, it's gonna be, again, talking. It's just, it's just gonna be a lot of re-educating, relearning um, and from the old way of thinking. Um, it just, it, it's, just, it's just gonna take time and, and energy put in and, and, and communication. Mm -hmm. is the best thing I have. What, what are you saying? Oh, I, I was just going to say that by law in North Carolina, I have to send out a letter um, twice a year to law enforcement mm -hmm. that says what we do, where we're at, and then to offer mm -hmm. um, any, you know, to come and talk if they want me to. And, and I've not ever gone like to a group, but I do get contacted individually mm -hmm. um, by different officers. Mm -hmm. And we have sat and had coffee and whatever and talked about the the program so that's you know that is helpful and it's, I think a little it's bit. not that it's not that they don't it's not that law enforcement doesn't know about mm -hmm. it it's a lot of times there are challenges in making that happen mm -hmm. from a law enforcement standpoint right right do they have a police diversion program at your syringe exchange not in pitt county oh okay i mean philadelphia Prevention Point Philadelphia has the PAD program where they have the police diversion program. If they pick someone up and they're, they have some substance abuse, they can take them and help with, with any bench warrants and stuff. Maybe the police can help that way. There are some lead programs in North Carolina, but there, there just isn't one here yet. Wow. Okay. That happened. Hmm. Hopefully we answered the question. Please. Oh, yes. There were seven new messages that okay. popped up after that. So, um, so one, everyone's, everyone's going to be calling. Well, I was going to say, yeah. Someone said, surely you can come speak to the officers, right? <laughs> um, someone, Jason, someone also asked you to talk a little more about crisis intervention teams and 
MHFA training for law enforcement officers and detention officers? Um, well, the, the mental health first aid training is what that is, is what I kind of touched on earlier. Um, we do provide mental health first aid training um, to detention staff as well as um, sheriff's deputies. Mm -hmm. We have yet to reach out to um, GPD in terms of our treatment, but I do know they receive it when they do their CIT training, their crisis intervention training. Um, and I mean, all it is, is, it's primarily just kind of educating people on how to deal with crisis situations, mental health, when they run across someone with mental health crisis, um, whether it be short-term or long-term, yeah. you know, depression, anxiety, things like that, and how to deal with it, um, and, and, and what to do, and just what to do to help the person get through that crisis mm -hmm. is the bottom line. So um, I'm, a, I'm a certified mental health first aid instructor. I do the classes personally myself, along with another officer. We have a detention center who's certified in mental health first aid um, instructor. So, I mean, we try and right now, as far as the detention center goes, we have, I think about 75, 80% of the detention center who's already completed the courses. Um, so we're, we're, you know, this is, this is, again, this is one of those things that Sheriff Dance wanted done. Yeah. And so we're going to make it happen. She wants all her, her staff to be educated on mental health and substance use issues mm -hmm. and as trained as they probably, you know, as well trained as we possibly can just to, um, like I said, we're just trying to marry the two. So we want everyone under our umbrella to be well-rounded. Mm -hmm. And, and then, I mean, that's how we're going to continue to educate everyone else, the public and, and other law enforcement agencies as well. Right. Thank you for that. That that's mm -hmm. an amazing number. So mm -hmm. like kudos yes. to 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 you and and that team and, and to the sheriff for, for sort of leading leading that charge. That that's amazing. What else do we have? So many. <laughs> this is awesome. So, we are so let me let me say if we don't get to your question today, because we do have a long list, thank you for that. Um, we will make a commitment to you to answer them and get them all out. There are some other, other of the panels, we didn't quite get to all the questions, but we will answer them as a collective and make sure that they, those, those answers are sent out to you. Awesome. Lee, you said harm reduction is a mindset. Um, how do we move people into that mindset? And specifically, how can we respond when people say, we need to put more money into treatment and not enable people who are using drugs. So first part of that is, is hard, um, <laughs> but helping to, I feel like the combat answer is education, right? But, but helping to draw the connection from planting the seeds of change, right? Harm reduction is about making sure that they and the public are safe during their active use or during times of, of engagement, but that it's not just about providing syringes, uh, clean syringes. It's about planting the seed of there's assistance, there's, a, there's other services available if and when you want those, right, for, for the individual. And how important that planting that seed is six months down the road when that one thing that happens to the individual that they say, I want to do something different, they know I can go to Diane, mm -hmm. right? I, I, that is who I trust, that's I know I, I have a entry point into the treatment services. So for me, the, the role of harm reduction, right? What Roz does is, is building that relationship that individuals that she interacts with know when I'm ready to enter treatment and when, you know, obviously we need to fund treatment, but the number of individuals that are willing and, and make that transition to go into treatment are enormously escalated through the work of harm reduction. So I'd say that there's a, a role of harm reduction to help the transition and expedite the transition into treatment. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that's where the funding should be, but also getting to understand. And if I'm being honest, I understand it because I see it. And so right. it, it's hard to truly trust and believe that engaging someone on, on a level of, I'm not here to make you change. I just want to talk to you about where you're at and have this conversation and be here for your basic needs mm -hmm. and how to see that come to fruition down the road of, I now want to do something different, so I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, 
but just knowing that that happens um, and, and therefore we need to support that process. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us, all of us across the state to share those stories, those success stories. Um, that was one of, the, one of the pieces we loved about you in the movie is, is here, not just seeing the hard work that you're doing, but also then being able to see people like come out on the other side and get clean and get healthy and, and be well again. One of the ways that, that I talk about it, because it's pretty easy and it's hard to really um, make mince words about it, is if we're going to spend $40,000 on housing someone in prison for a year or on treatment, which is very much more expensive than any of the other non-clinical or non-enforcement sort of services, why would we not do that? Um, once you get to those points, you can never go backwards. You can never go from a place of being in prison or, or you know, having, <clears throat> having an addiction that has been untreated and then go back to a place of not ever having had that happen to you. And so why would we not invest in, in the non-clinical spaces, which are much less expensive and much more human? Uh, than, than waiting until it gets so bad that, that that's the only option. So right. what else do we have? <laughs> um, just a quick side note, Diane and Jason, y'all might get some requests for trainings. Um, <laughs> there's a lot going on in the chat about getting you guys together to do some training. So we will make sure that at the end of this, you have all the resources that have been mentioned. Um, we will check with panelists and see um, if they're comfortable with us giving you their contact info and things like that, but we will make sure that if that's something that you want to happen, that we will get you in touch to make it happen. Um, okay, can we talk about peer support in local emergency rooms? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Jan Britt, who is one of the ladies that works firsthand with behavioral and people coming in for um, overdoses and things like that. We have been pushing for that. We do have a um, committee here with Divided, with Biden Hospital and um, Mr. Glenn Simpson, he is over that. And it has been talked about for a long time to get peer support in the hospitals when it comes to people that's coming in for mental health breaks and substance use overdoses and things of that nature, because it's, his, it, it's, it's needed. Um, I know in the Mecklenburg area, they do have peer supports in their hospitals to handle such things when they come in, to help them when they come in, to help them when they get ready to transition and things of that nature. But here in Eastern North Carolina, I still don't understand why peer supports are not in the hospitals because they are gonna come right back out and get themselves, it's, it's a, a vicious cycle almost. And if you, if, People are saying they want to stop, but you're not bringing us in as peer supports. They help you guys to work that out with people that are coming in to the hospitals and you're tired of seeing us. And I say us because I'm in recovery and you're tired of seeing us. Why don't you bring us as peers, as peers that's in recovery to help these people, not these people, but help my babies or our folks get the help that they need or they want and they desire instead of just not wanting to deal with it. So that's something that we've been talking about and it's still not happening, but still gonna keep pushing forward. That goes to one of my one of my answers to what policy is not necessarily policy, it's the concept of integrated care. Mm -hmm. That we've made great strides in that direction, mm -hmm. but my personal opinion, we don't, we're not looking at the models of treatment that work, peer support, harm reduction, along with professional services that can be part of that integrated care model, both at the jail or detention centers in healthcare settings and other settings, just bringing the whole continuum of, of uh, behavioral health or social services in to the conversation as part of this true integrated care model was what's needed. Um, and I think it's clear. Yeah. You know, yeah. in, in oh. Philly, I'm sorry. No, go for it. In Philly, they have a team called the AR2 team. And, and this is before they even get to the ER, where if someone overdosed, 
the AR2 team would consist of an EMS worker, mm -hmm. a peer specialist, and a social worker. Mm -hmm. And being at the scene, watching this team work, it, it actually grows connection with, with not only the EMS worker, because at times you've got EMS workers who also stigmatize our people. Mm -hmm. But to see that, um, it's, it's amazing. But also to wanting to have it in an emergency room, like I work the ER and when my sunshines come in, I mean, they like, they're excited to see someone that they know that won't, that won't stigmatize them. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely needed in the mm -hmm. ER. I mean, I'm not a peer specialist. Um, I don't have that kind of lived experience, but the lived experience that I have is, is again, meeting them where they are and them recognizing, mm -hmm. recognizing us and mm -hmm. saying, you know, you know, they didn't forget about me whether I'm on the street or whether I'm in the yeah, ER. There you go. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's meeting them where they at. But it, maybe we can link up with, because they have social workers in the ER. Mm -hmm. They do. Mm -hmm. Maybe that can be a thing that can happen, but. Yeah. I was going to say, I think one of the things that's really critical in this conversation is talking healthcare, bringing healthcare discussions to healthcare workers. So um, I'm a cancer survivor. And when I was first diagnosed, they brought in my oncologist, they brought in my radiation oncologist, then they brought in an, what they called an oncopsychologist, so a psychiatrist, then they brought in a um, wellness center person, and then they brought in a survivor. And that was all part of that center of excellence for cancer care. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember taking note of thinking, wow, this is, really makes a whole lot of sense. And it's a lot of what we have, mm -hmm. but seems fragmented. Right. So I think on the ground in the ERs, a lot of people see this. I mean, they see it every day. When we're talking to administrations, we have to pull back and talk that language. Mm -hmm. And so what do you provide for cancer survivors? What do you provide for those that are you know, heart yeah. disease patients? Oh, well, there's support there. There's peer support in that role. And then try to bring that around because maybe, maybe we get the light bulb on that way. Maybe not, but it's there are models and our models aren't all that dissimilar. Mm -hmm. So how do we make that connection? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Roz, can you mention, someone's asking what the name of the law enforcement program you mentioned that helps with bench warrants? It's called the PAD program and it's through uh, Prevention Point Philadelphia. It's the diversion program. So they also have certified peer specialists um, and the police, if they arrest someone and they realize that they're in active addiction, they bring them to the PAD program and they're connected with prevention point and with um, doctors if they need Suboxone or whatever their, their treatment is. So, and they help lift with the bench warrants and stuff like that. Awesome. Um, Jason, the sharp and wear programs. Do you have numbers on like how many folks are taking advantage of those programs within the detention center? And then do you have any idea how many of those folks began their use as a result of pain control or like through prescription opioids? Um, not off the top of my head, no, um, but I can, I mean, since we started um, going through the program, I mean, we do do intensive interviews for everyone who fills out an application. The program's all voluntary. Um, so again, off the top of my head, no, I don't have exact numbers. I don't want to start spewing numbers that I can't, that are not concrete right now. Um, but I have heard that story. I've heard the story several times where it starts with, you know, a prescription and graduates in the, into illicit pills and graduates to heroin. So it is very common. Um, you know, I hear that story more often than not. I mean, they don't just become criminals overnight or just start, you know, stealing things for money. And that's not how that works. It's not how it happens. Um, it's, it's simply because, you know, they, they develop that behavior because they don't want to be sick. 
it's not even a, it's not, they're not even doing it to get high. But a lot of people say, I just want to get high. Well, they, they're doing it because now they're sick, you know, so now they just want to prevent that sickness. And um, so that's where that behavior comes from. Um, anyone, you know, if you want, I would encourage, I don't know who asked the question, obviously, but I would encourage anyone that would like the information, you know, you can always reach out to me via email. I, I, don't, I won't have any problem giving out my email address or you can go to the you know, Pitt County Sheriff's website, get my email address. Um, and, you know, we can discuss that information further, but I wouldn't, I'm just, I wouldn't be comfortable now giving you numbers because I just don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> You don't want to make it up. Right. Definitely don't want to make it up. <laughs> a million people. Thank you. Um, okay. Hold on. Um, Lee, how are the counselor training programs going beyond interview skills and integrating recovery response and support into curriculum? That's something that we are very focused on and, and it's both recovery as well as other issues related to mental health and, and even uh, issues related to multicultural diversity, equity, inclusion, looking at where we are and how our communities, how our clients and how our uh, future providers need to be to interact effectively uh, with the clients that they work with. So you have the basic skills, you know, counseling skills, you have the information, the knowledge. What's important for us is that they are part of the treatment community, right? And that starts at education and awareness and goes all the way through to, you know, more acute level treatment and everything in between, as well as the ongoing recovery process. So understanding um, what the recovery process is, what all the different levels of care and uh, entry points and touch points are for an individual in recovery. And that we as future mental health substance use counselors or, or they, as they graduate, are one or maybe two bullet points on that long continuum, that they don't make up treatment, that they make up a piece of an individual's uh, path towards recovery and, and through recovery. Uh, so. Things that we do, we you know, when Jim Michael is still at ECU, bringing him in um, and tapping into our resources to do recovery messaging training, um, making sure that we're aware, connecting through advocacy projects. Pretty much every course that we have, particularly the addiction focused ones, has some level of an advocacy project where we have them interact with community projects. So we've the Pitt County Coalition on Substance Use is a big resource, collegiate recovery program on campus, and other sources in the community getting a taste for, getting involved in what is going on in our field and what's going on with the clients that we serve and how can I be part of a change? And by doing that, not only do you get to you know, have a voice in advocacy, but our students get to learn it's more than just what we do in, in, those, in the room, right? It, 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 there's a, recovery is huge um, and uh, being aware of what that is. So that's kind of the, the best way we know how uh, to bring it in. Okay. So do we have time or anything for one more or are we good? Um, I have, yes, I think we can fit in one more. And then the others, like you said, we will provide answers to because um, every question answer brings up more questions, which yes. is awesome. <laughs> but also, thank awesome. you guys for talking to us. We wish you were here. In I know, I love it. <laughs> um, okay, Diane, what are some of the challenges Ekim is currently facing how can the community get involved? And some folks have asked about donation information. So can you just tell us kind of an overview of how we can support the work you're doing? Um, well, we're, we have no employees. So there are no paid employees. Everybody is a volunteer. So volunteers are, are always something we can use. You don't have to be um, someone with used experience. But we really like to have people who have had used experience because they're really helpful in, in talking to the talking to the clients. Um, it, we're happy with donations. Doesn't have to be money. Toothbrushes, toothpaste. Um, trying to think of the kind of soap they like. 
Um, anyway, <laughs> someone Next. actually wrote like a long list of things you provide <laughs> in the chat. Okay. So we will make sure we pull that and yeah. I'll check it with Bars you. But so <laughs> female, female hygiene products, all those kinds of things that, you know, that we purchase if somebody felt, you know, like that they would rather donate that than, than money, that would be awesome as well. Great. I didn't realize you were all volunteer. Yeah. Until you just said it just now. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it was, it was the program was self-funded the first three years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, closing remarks. We have just a couple more minutes. I, I know we could we could all stay and solve all the world's problems probably <laughs> at some point, and and certainly talk about all the challenges that we all face. But um, any any. Last comments that anyone wants to make before we, we sign off from our friends out there? Carrie Narcan. Yes. <laughs> Carrie Please Narcan. Get trained on how to administer Narcan. We do also have Narcan. That's mm -hmm. kind of fabulous. Mm -hmm. Self care, any type of self care that's going to mm -hmm. um, increase who you are already. Um, even if it's a cold can Pepsi in the freezer for a little bit, mm -hmm. not till it freeze. If that's part of your self care, mm -hmm. then utilize that too. Mm -hmm. I'd say across the board, engage in particularly when it comes to the policies or thoughts or services. Encourage proactive as opposed to react. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of things we see in mental health and addiction, things are funded out of desperate need, mm -hmm. took a crisis to get people more services for, for opioids so, or, or an epidemic. So mm -hmm. being proactive, talking to your community that, that sees this on the front line and talking about what is needed for sustained change, not what's that one thing we can throw money at this year to fix and then walk away from it. Right, yeah. right. Okay. I was just gonna say, if you don't know who your legislator is, today's a great day to find that out, your, your state legislator, your congressional representator, and tell them of the good work that you're doing, please. Mm -hmm. Share with them, and these conversations of what we need, what policies need to happen, they start with you. For you taking the amount of time you did today doing this means a lot, and it means your heart is in this, so let's carry it forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And if you need help with that, we can see certainly can, we can prep you, we can make you feel comfortable, we can give you talking points. Yeah. Um, not everyone is so comfortable in that environment, so reach out to us, we are happy to help. Um, shame, again, last sort of shameless plug for the survey that is out there. Um, please fill that out, I promise you that that is what we are doing with it. We are taking the information that you give us and then shepherding that forward with our leaders and making sure that, that voice is amplified. So picking up on that, um, please, please do fill that out for us so that we can speak on your behalf and on behalf of our communities and what they need in North Carolina. Feel free to share that link with your friends too. They don't have to have seen the movie to share their opinion. So, so we can all be frustrated, we can all do our job, but what we can't do is be quiet. So please don't be quiet. Um, share with us how we can help and, and please do speak out. And I think that is about, we're just about time. Um, thank you for everyone. Thank you to our fabulous panelists for the great conversation and for donating your, donating your time uh, with us today and for sitting with us and, and sharing um, your experience. So, and that is a wrap. Uh, bye everyone. <laughs>